Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. I hope you all have been staying in and have been tuning in to our online episodes and live sessions. For those who haven't attended an Avid Learning program before, a very brief introduction. We are a public programming platform and the cultural arm of the SR Group that began in 2009. In fact, in October of last year, we completed 10 years of programming. We conduct close to 150 programs a year in the area of art, culture and heritage, innovation, literature, and design across formats like panel discussions, workshops, masterclasses, and festivals. Avid Online, our online digital further learning campaign was launched on across our social media platforms as a response to the COVID crisis in April 2020. The objective is to enable our patrons and stakeholders like yourselves to engage with a range of topics across the breadth of the arts. The focus of the campaign is to keep members of the creative community connected, facilitate interactions and exchange of ideas. We continue to evolve this campaign by expanding our formats and reintroducing our existing IPs online and working with our longtime collaborators to present thematic programs and series. So without further ado, welcome to Tradition Meets Modernity, Designing and Presenting and Presenting Heritage with head of Siddharth Das Studio, Vice Chairman, JD Center of Art, Siddharth Das. For more about him, please refer to his bio, which has probably been pasted in the chat section and has also been emailed to you earlier. In today's se session, participants are in for a visual treat. We will have a chance to learn about the various nuances and skills required for exhibition design, adapting heritage buildings, curating museum galleries, and much more. Very quickly, please note this presentation will last for about an hour followed by a Q&A in which I will ask Siddharth about his journey, his eclectic projects that he may not have had time to cover. He will also address questions submitted by the audiences. So please do keep your questions ready and submit them in the chat box. Siddharth has many fascinating projects to cover. We've seen a sneak peek of the presentation before, so I know that. So this might turn into a lecture demonstration if we don't let him begin very soon. So without further ado, thank you for tuning in over to Siddharth and look forward to a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Asad. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Asad and Avid Learning for this opportunity. Um, it's always exciting to kind of share one's journey of, and to kind of look back while this may be a master class it may not be much of a master class that's a different issue but it's always exciting to share a trajectory and about 18 years of one's work and to have learnings which are my own um, and if anyone can use them for their benefit that'd be great uh, so i'm going to talk a little about how i started uh, this whole journey so it was 18 years ago that I started my studio. I had just graduated and probably in retrospect, this may have not been the wisest thing to have done, but I did it and in complete naivety. Uh, but it's been an incredible journey of heartaches and exhilarating uh, successes, not by money or by fame, but just by the virtue of having done something that one felt really proud of and being a part of it. Uh, so it's been 20 years of professional life, 18 years of running the studio, uh, in which I've worked in about eight countries and on a hundred projects with a team, uh, which consists of various professionals from various different genres and disciplines. Uh, I wanted to do a little overview of what this journey has been about, and then to kind of go into more deeply into a few projects. This was my first project. It was my thesis project at NID, and I went on to work on this for many months after. It was with the lovely Martin Singh, or Mapu, as he was endearingly called. 
um, I got a chance to work with Vikram Sadesai in Bangalore on this project. And the idea was to envisage a beautiful um, space that celebrated Khadi. And Mapu had this vision that, you know, they should be like looms with cascading fabrics that you could touch as you walked by. And if you could create mannequins that felt Indian and not uh, be kind of Western looking mannequins. So from that, uh, as a young adult, I realized that um, that would be fabulous if I could experience different parts of the world and work on projects with the best places that one could dream of. And I was very lucky and fortunate to work um, and do an internship at the Victor Albert Museum. And I went on to work a bit after the internship. And the exhibition I worked on was this particular exhibition called Encounters of Meeting of Asia and Europe. And me being an Asian and working with a Norwegian uh, colleague at the design studio at the BND was really exciting. So how does one really en you know, kind of envisage a space that is as much European as is Asian in a format that's very contemporary but celebrates the arts of different genres? And this in many ways was very kind of exciting and left an indelible mark for me. Uh, I think the idea that you could have a fabulous cross-cultural conversation and a dialogue which manifest itself across dimensions. And then I went on to work at the Museum Reefer in Zurich with the lovely Eberhard Fischer. And I was very lucky and fortunate to work with um, a very fine gentleman called Dr. Johannes Bells, who went on to become a dear friend. And it was to envisage the space of uh, palm leaf manuscripts that actually come from Orissa. And they and I'm half from Orissa, half Gujarati. So you know, when you have roots in a space, uh, you always feel a sense of attachment to them. And though these were historic palm leaves, it didn't seem to matter. So here we were in this incredible, beautiful 19th century villa in the center of uh, Zurich, in a place called Hazem Key, uh, to create a modern way of showing it. And later on, we went on to display an exhibition of which I also curated. And I'm going to talk more at length about this exhibition and this larger project later in the presentation um, of the masterclass. And this is about the collection of Pankha. And Pankha, or the Indian hand fans, are, for us, always have to do with summer and the season that we are in right now. And the idea and the romance of it also. And I'll talk about it later again. Uh, and then there were lots of these projects that one got uh, commissioned to do a proposal. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't work out. But it was so exciting to be part of the journey. This was to do the replanning of the Red Cross Museum in Geneva. Uh, so there were nine architects or designers like Shege Ruban, who did the Pompidou Center in Metz, David Ajay, who's just been selected to the new Kiranada Museum, Shege Ruban. So, like a whole bunch of uh, Roka and there's. So, incredible array of architects. So it, was, it felt quite uh, kind of humbling to be part of the group. Uh, it would have been even better if we got selected. Uh, the other such uh, projects that I was part of were the public space design of this place in Mexico, which is in Monterrey, uh, and the public space design for a place in Chiba in Japan. So they were quite exciting because you had to work in a different paradigm and a different culture and understand what it meant to work for the place and work with an array of people who were people that one hadn't experienced working with. Uh, but from that, I want to go on to projects that we actually did do. So here's a project, which is uh, the design of India International Center. And this though is a thematic exhibition which uh, was there for a short period of time. It actually celebrated an institution that I really have immense respect and regard for. Um, and I titled this exhibition that I curated also, Form and Spirit, because if one has been to the International Center, you realize that the understatement is the statement. And that is something I remember that Kapila Vatsan said when I interviewed her, and you see on the left, this projection with her talking about it as a life trustee. So one of the things that came about was this whole way of creating a narrative, which was really um, integrating curation with design and never separating the two. 
And this is, I think, in many ways, uh, something that I really, um, I think, became one of our striking uh, underlying uh, ways of working. There were some institutional projects that came about. And in 2013-14, I worked on the Indian Institute of Art and Design uh, in Okla. And it was a warehouse of 60,000 square feet. And the idea was to reimagine it and adapt it to become a design college, which then opened a few years ago, uh, which is this. And with the whole complexity of institutional design came these amazing challenges. And that is something I really enjoyed. And the idea was to kind of use those learnings and use them for other such places, especially cultural spaces. Uh, so here is the Jodhpur Museum, the government museum that I was fortunate enough to win the bid for, and then we did the curation design for. And I will talk again at length on these three projects here on. Uh, the JD Center of Art, something I'm very close to, and I'll talk again at length later. And what it meant to work with an architect like Bibi Doshi, who created this incredible edifice and designed this with Studio Van Rose help, uh, to creating completely heritage-based projects. This is Jal Mahal in Jaipur, which uh, was a reservoir and built in, inside a reservoir which predated it, and built as a pleasure pav pavilion. Uh, I think celebrating the arts was one of the key parts of readapting that space. And I will again talk later about this, and about how does one interpret the idea of heritage and create thematic exhibitions or permanent museum spaces. But from there, there are other kinds of spaces where people meet and gather. And these are flagship stores for Bombay and Bangalore airports that we did. And the idea was to celebrate the kind of contemporary culture that we have. And the idea of travel, the idea of suitcases that were leathered and you know, when travel was luxury, was stylish. So if you go back to the kind of old pictures we see of Air India and you know, Jamshir Ji Tata and you know, smart dresses, smart catering. So the idea was to hark back to that idea of that temporary and chic in some ways and how it's changed to the idea of heritage. Uh, here, these are the flagship stores of Bangalore Airport and we are celebrating the traditional heritage of South Indian crafts and culture. So we worked with a whole array of craftspeople from granite, uh, stone artisans to lacquerware, uh, wooden pieces from Chennapatna over here, like little sleeves, to kalamkari textiles on the top, dyed in Indian madder and indigo. So these ones you see in Indian madder. Working with weavers from Tamil Nadu. It's a whole array of people, but working and combining that with a traditional uh, kind of milieu with a contemporary milieu. So it is situated in the airport. It is very vibrantly different. And we created three such spaces. And we went on to do some installations for the airport too. Uh, and from the kind of permanence to impermanence. And this is something that has always fascinated me about the duality of both and how exciting both are. So this was performance, more installations which are transient for the South Bank Center. And I think this whole idea of working across disciplines is something that has been very exciting for me. It has been a, a journey of bringing together arts, crafts, culture in those manners, but with architecture and design and bringing in tradition and modernity. So if we see from far, this is, uh, has something that we cannot probably possibly situate in either. Uh, and this was another such piece that we did for the South Bank Center in London. But the idea was that when one came closer, the piece revealed itself. And there were new nuances that you came across that you didn't really realize before. So this is an installation that was inspired by the 16th century poem Baramas by Keshav Das, which is a love poem, but the idea that it alludes to love in the 12 seasons as such, or the 12 months, is the thing that kind of excited me. So I thought, how do we talk about crafts and modernity for this installation, which I called Kal, a memory of time, to going on to doing permanent 
art programming where one creates a scenography a curation and site specific art so this is for a humongous private building in amdavad uh you have getting in kalamkari paintings to the sculpture you saw radha krishnan and the marble lotuses to working with crafts and working with crafts so going from a space oriented approach to product oriented approach also and how do you situate the product in the space so this was a project with bamboo but from that the idea of documenting crafts so this was a fabulous um, project for me i worked with leila tayarji who i had chanced upon when i was uh, 19 years old and she was possibly the first person i worked with and i was so excited i worked in baripada my father's hometown and many years later i worked with her on this book i did the photography and design and the idea was to celebrate 11 women's journeys in textiles in the country so i took many of the photographs some were taken by the authors but about three fourths were taken by me and then the book was designed by me so the idea was to really supplement the text with photographs that really want an embellishment as such but created a different narrative and a design which would be in a very visually rich thing to be very simple and minimalistic and this love for photography is something that has drawn me to a lot of publication design including the one for nandita das and her film on mantu so the book of mantu and i is a visually beautifully rich book with amazing photographs sadly not by me but the journey and the excitement is nonetheless the same so how do you how do you portray a journey of a film that has that's gritty that tells stories which are gritty and beautifully poignantly said into a book that does justice to it and that takes me back to the idea of photography itself um i i got my first second hand uh, slr camera when i was 10 years old uh and it's been 36 years of photographing since of bumbling my way learning a bit and then attempting regularly um and learning how to do bromides and uh developing things yourself so this is a photograph that i took and then i went on to use this idea for doing the kind of pieces i did for arts illustrated i had a lovely three year span in which i did a travel column for the bi monthly magazine uh, with my photographs and my writings and coalescing design art craft architecture so pretty much the kind of area i wanted to be in but not talk about our work as much as what was happening around the world around the country urban international rural and i think this takes me pretty much to the kind of approach i think while growing up you know my mother comes from bombay is a gujarati but comes from an urban uh, city my father comes from baripada which is a provincial little town in mayurbhanj district in orissa and i was born in bombay but grew up in delhi and lived in south india so when you've traveled and worked like that what happens is i think at least to me it happened and my to my sister was that all those parts became part of our roots and those roots were something that kind of shaped us and it shaped the idea of how we wanted to imbue work so any work that my studio does or that i do the idea is to really have a holistic and responsible approach to really not look at just design or an area of design or to say okay this is exhibition design but look at exhibition product graphics uh, digital media interaction design textile design together but also look at other paradigms because design is only one paradigm so how do you look at narratives how do you look at responsibility how do you look at ecology how do you look at education and while doing that how can we do it by celebrating tradition and technology we are as incredible for it as we are for the immense cultural heritage so the idea was to really bring about these two things together uh and so the idea was to really start this dialogue and to have this kind of crossover approach between genres and disciplines uh while we did that the idea was also to not create a style based studio approach but to create something which was approach led something where we really talked about why did we want to do things so to create what was best for the project and not what just looked funky and to always intertwine curation and design together not never to kind of separate it and one of the things that came early on was that design should never be reduced to just good aesthetics i remember is coming across this uh, lovely quote of picasso's that good aesthetics are 
is the enemy of creativity or something to that effect. Uh, so the idea was how do we really take in all the key stakeholders and while we address all the key stakeholders, how do we really look at the best practices? And when we did that, how do we address the entire gamut of projects that we would work with? Be it heritage and museum, be it cultural and public spaces, be it art and craft projects, looking at livelihood projects, you know, and trying to make sure that these things could happen in a manner that really benefited all the stakeholders. Looking at the arts, looking at visual arts, as well as performance arts, looking at the spaces that they are situated within, and looking at interactivity and digital media. So to really bring in these elements, not as separate elements, but as a crossover element. So I want to go into four projects in greater detail. And with these, uh, with this at the back of my head and the kind of uh, underlying basis for why I've uh, chosen these four projects to show. It's not the fact that these Nestle are the biggest or the smallest, but they are to me the most important in the way they present traditional modernity. And uh, frankly, at least one of them is possibly the project which is closest to my heart. Uh, so I'm going to start with the Jal Mahal. Uh, my team and I, we worked on the Jal Mahal for one and a half years. Uh, Jal Mahal, as some of you know, is a beautiful historic pleasure pavilion made in Jaipur in the middle of a reservoir facing Amir Fort. And here it is resplendent with beautiful light that skims off the water. And the idea was to use the quality of water and light in the way we work with the arts. So the idea was to readapt this kind of pleasure pavilion in a manner that celebrated uh, the 19th century arts, but in a way that really played with this beautiful ethereal quality of light. So if you see, it's as if, if I go back the slide and you see these arches, it's as if, you know, when the light comes through there, to imagine what would happen, almost preempting that, and to create an amazing experience which is transient. So here you see the gold glows. And if you are further away, you see the gold is not glowing. It's much more yellow and muted. And further down, it's just dark. So naturally in the evenings and night, it's augmented with the lighting that there is. But also the idea of how do you create those creepers and this kind of beautiful, very typically traditional Rajasthani miniature painting style, but fresco style. So I went around to lots of monuments. I made lots of little drawings of flowers that I found in Pundrik Jiki Haveli, Nahargar, Amir Fort, so on and so forth. And based on those flowers, um, so I worked with these seven artists, one of whose hands you see here in his head. And the idea was to create this dialogue in an atelier fashion, which wasn't about, you know, either top down saying, you know, you do this and this is how it should happen, or the fact I commission you and I don't know what you will do and I'll just come once in a while. It was a journey which was co-creating. So I spent 15 months, first six months was just a labor of love and figure out how to go about, to just see a lot of things, to experiment, and then it was to really start creating. So here you see this beautiful rendition of a celestial being in the clouds, being painted by Shambhi Sharma and his team. But the idea was each of these pieces we composed and conceived together, and we would create these albums and dossiers of how it would be in the such. And here you have this beautiful array of clouds and the celestial beings in them. And so further away when it's finished, you have this beautiful sense of layered composition. Now naturally being in Rajasthan, there's a whole sense of havelis and palaces, dime a dozen. So the idea wasn't to create that. The idea was to create a space which would again play with light, play with the space. So here you have a monochromatic gray um, arch at the back and you have this play of clouds. Now this play of clouds here, there's a close up. You see a part of the albums. We created many albums. So I thought, you know, you have this project and if we could almost think about this project as if there's a royal patron. Okay? And naturally the idea is not to celebrate feudality or anything like that, but the idea is to celebrate the idea of patronage. So this project became um, quietly a patron uh, to the arts of that region. So I chose 40 odd um, artists, some I chose, some the organization that commissioned me chose. And we created a dossier of images. Here it is the depiction of flora and of trees. Uh, the color palette, then we had a dossier of mountains, a dossier of clouds, a dossier of flowers, and so on and so forth. So, and then we created these things. And I say we, naturally, I didn't paint them, so I have lesser at stake. But the idea was 
he conceived it in great detail and how it would format, be formatted, what would be the composition. So this was something that took a good 14 months or so. And it's spectacular. Um, it's many, many meters long. And it is something that we all fell in love with. And the organizers then said that we can't display it. So here we had to then technologically reproduce it and have it being repainted in metallic colors over on the top. But you also see the lighting. The lighting is these melon-shaped lights with glass. And they look very simple and they look very, the, the typical 19th century or 20th century uh, lights that you have, but all the glass is cast again. You play with the refraction so that the glass is thicker in places, so the way the light refracts through it creates a drama. The pictures actually don't do it justice because uh, the, it, was, it, it had a much more nuanced light which somehow sometimes cameras don't catch. And then the way the fasteners are, the brass clings, all of them are cast new pieces to make sure that if it's windy or there's a dust storm, which you have often in Jaipur and Rajasthan, that doesn't fall off. So the idea of that whole making, but to make it look like it was nothing new. Uh, so, and there are many, many, many stories over there, and I don't want to go because naturally when every time one shows a project, you know, you almost reminisce, you live in that time again, and you want to tell so many stories. So it's a shame that, you know, one has to always kind of cut them down, but that's the nature of things. The second project is very, very different in a manner that is, uh, which really, I think, talks about the theme of this entire session, which is tradition and modernity. And it looks at arts. So JD Center of Art, JD Center of Art is possibly uh, the project I'm fondest of and has given me the biggest heartaches. I've lost a lot of hair, a lot of sleep, a lot of resources, but I love it to death. Uh, it is uh, an art center which is being created to blur the lines between arts and crafts, between us and them, or people like us, what is creators and what is an audience, who are adults and who are children. And in a way, creating that paradigm by bringing in all the arts under one roof, you know, and not looking at division between contemporary art, traditional art. Um, there's a beautiful uh, museum in Basel called the Baila Foundation. There are so few examples of precedences for this, but that is one of them. And it does it in a very Swiss manner, which was designed by Renzo Piano. And it has a polyclee sculpture and a Giacometti sculpture next to a sculpture from Ivory Coast made by a tribal uh, artist. So this is in many ways uh, similar, or, but yet very different. And it's, it's a center that's being built. It's a center that's being built in Orissa, uh, my father's home state. And it is um, in Bhubaneswar. And in Bhubaneswar, it is next to the Khandigiri Caves. And the Khandigiri Caves are these beautiful, very austere second century BC Jain caves. And you see this green patch opposite our site, which is marked in white and in red over there. And you see the building, which is uh, semi-built. And uh, as I uh, mentioned, B.B. Doshi is the architect. So B.B. Doshi, uh, as all of us know, is one of the most celebrated architects of the century from India. And even if one shouldn't talk about the awards and things like that, it is quite exciting to see the kind of awards he's got, the Pritzker, the Aga Khan Foundation. And it, is, it was so exciting to be able to dialogue with him on the project, a project that we will actually use and create, but a building that he has envisioned, which is sculptural. But while doing that, we wanted to look at how will the building really be something that will resonate with our collection, but also uh, be something that is really suited to the climatic conditions that uh, there are. Often we have buildings that are cold in the winter, hot in the summer, humid in the rains. So we wanted to create an ethos and environment that is really conducive to the public, but also to the objects. So we looked at air currents, we looked at the way, you know, are there uh, cavity walls in air, we looked at um, the temperature, we looked at the humidity, we looked at the particle matter in the air. And living in Delhi, where I have my studio and my home, Pollution is something we really grapple with and being on the national highway, this is something it will only get worse. We wanted to kind of preempt a lot of the issues and not suddenly have them thrown upon us. So a lot of that went into doing a full environmental quality energy assessment by a physicist in Oxford who spent a lot of time piled us and it was very lovely and I uh, had to grovel because she's also my cousin, you know, so 
there's a bit of coercion, bit of groveling, but more groveling than anything else. And we came about with examples of how to answer those things and you know, relate that back to the architect. So here you have the airflow movement, like I mentioned before. And while doing that, we also looked at passive cooling methodologies. And nature is possibly the most exciting art form because you have very little handle on what will happen. But here, lo and behold, you'll have an amazing tree which will flower, which will fruit, birds will come to it. We'll have an ecosystem of butterflies and worms and caterpillars and so on and so forth. But it also creates an amazing thermal mass. It provides cooling, you know, it, uh, and that is something quite incredible, but also provides food. So you started looking at the kind of foods the cafe could serve, and the kind of flowers that would be there, and how do they, when do they flower and things like that. And we went on to simultaneously start planning our spaces. So everything was to do simultaneous planning so that the orchestration could be seamless. So here we look at the master plan of how the space will be. So naturally it came with a kind of a brief that was shared with the architect. And here again, I must mention uh, Studio Vandro, Leba, Rohit Raj and Vandini, that who basically took on uh, Doshi's idea and gave it a concrete form in a sense of dialogue, in a series of dialogues of what we wanted. And being a person who has architects in his team and designers in his team, I was very careful that we didn't actually talk about the form, but much more about the usage and the functionality of it. So as we went along, the idea was to really talk about the spaces that we have, which are, sorry, I skipped this slide. Yeah. Where do we want what to come? So which are the galleries, which are the backbones of the museum? Where's the storage? Where's the conservation cell? Where is the administrative part? And where is the art residency part? So this is something very interesting because the mandate for this art center is it's a museum, but it's a museum which is an art museum, but it's also an ethnographic museum. It's also a craft museum. And with that, it combines an art residency format. An art residency which will be a residency for artists who are traditional and contemporary. So a lot of kind of ongoing live activities. So we had to plan for that. And we had to plan how would we show those things? How would we have a whole bunch of services that are bunged in seamlessly so that you don't really notice that here there's a light which does such and such thing, but you see the effect of it. And you see a seamlessness of how the space is populated by the furniture that is created by taking apart almost that how will the exhibits come in and how will the entire circulation happen. But all of these are linked to how you actually want to use it. So what kind of activities do we want to have? Activities that are like meet the artist, a monthly kind of a talk show, a film festival that happens. So I help produce and co-curate this film festival, which is curated by the lovely and the doyen of cinema, Aruna Vasude, and a team of amazing curators, Raman Chavla, Sudeep London, Nandan Saxena and the works. And we show a whole array of films that celebrate the arts from across the world. And it's completely, again, like, and in many ways, this kind of resonates with the kind of work my studio does, which is really to look at seamlessness across genre and disciplines. So you have animation, you have ethnographic films, design, architecture, traditional craft, and the making of things. Uh, this is the film festival. It's a small film festival done in ludicrously small sum of money, but it is beautiful and it's vibrant and it runs to packed audiences. But it's a, it's a labor of love. It's workshops, performances, live activities, uh, presentations, so on and so forth. But central to the art center and the museum is its collection and looking after the collection. So I also lead the team that is managing the collections, archiving, photographing, conserving. So really to make it part of our design planning. So our whole building is planned for preventive conservation rather than being something that comes in later. And then the collection itself over here. You have Jatin Das's work because it is his museum, the contemporary art collection, which has from Himmat Shah to Souza to Hussain, uh, Ram Kinkar Bej, Paramjit Singh, the Manupai, a whole variety, a slew of amazing artists, gone and living, but also amazing collection of traditional arts. And it's an eclectic collection. You have Pankhas, which is, holds a pride, uh, pride of place. You have traditional arts and crafts and you have traditional textiles. 
So the pankhas in itself roughly number about 6,000. It's an incredible bevy of crafts um, and celebrates, celebrates the crafts and celebrates especially a dying craft form. And the idea was to showcase this amazing collection in different formats. So this was uh, an exhibition I curated and designed, which was at Museum Reedberg. I showed this image before. And it looks at the idea of the pankhas in summer, you know, almost they float in midair as if uh, the heat makes them levitate. And it's situated in this beautiful 19th century house on Kiel space in Zurich. And also creating the bevy of other things that come with it. So the posters that were scattered across the country and the city from airports to tram stations to hotels and museums. It felt quite lovely to see them everywhere, to have brochures, programming of it, and then to have a completely different format. So this was possibly the most definitive exhibition of Pankha till date. There have been about 10 odd exhibitions across about eight or nine countries. But this was an exhibition that happened in Delhi at Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, uh, across about 12,000 square feet. And the idea was again to have it in a way which is very temporary. And it was to purposely show the temporary, temp almost that temporary, I can't say the word, sorry, <laughs> temporality. Uh, but also um, to have that modernity and tradition being part of it. So here you see, it's to almost make it precious, but not too precious, to make people come close, but not touch them. And, you know, allow a narrative uh, where the texts reveal themselves only as you came closer and naturally the programming. So here you have curated walks that happened, publication that gave an insight into the project, but also the design of the publication. So. Again, uh, so this is uh, edited and designed and produced uh, by us. Um, again, and the way to have almost this kind of minimalist Japanese approach to design in a way, but also imbuing with a very kind of Indian um, kind of ethos. And that led to designing a whole bunch of lovely stamps, which uh, we have 16 stamps on the Pankha collection, which you can see in most large uh, post offices across the country. And then while talking about it, looking at the whole digital platform, and I mean, even the virtue of making this presentation online is something. So this is how it's going to be more and more. I mean, hopefully it won't be COVID again and again, but you know, the whole idea of being able to access something remotely. And that's why we are working on the whole app, the website. So we have the website, which is already up and about. So and if you want to see, you can get a sense, but also the design and the curation of it, the narrative again on the website. And then the newsletter. So all of these items um, are programmed, content, curation and design is done by us. And the idea of how do we envisage something like that and anyone can sign up. So we want to make it things very democratic. So if it's a public domain thing, then it must be accessible. And this is the last newsletter we did. The next one is due in some time. Uh, and that, uh, I can go on about Jiri Center of Art, but I have to stop about that because Otherwise, like as I said, it'll become a leg dem and possibly it already is. So I have to check myself and I go on to the next project, which looks at a museum that we've finished. So while GD Center of Art is being built and hopefully next year it will open, uh, if everything works out well and it should, uh, we would love you all to visit it. But here's a museum that you can visit and that's the Museum of Jodhpur, uh, which is Sadar Government Museum or the Jodhpur Government Museum. And situated within a beautiful, denuded sadly, but a beautiful garden of uh, nonetheless, called Umed Udyan. So this was uh, a museum which was like the kind of museums we have scattered across the country, a Kalulian vestige, in a warehouse of eclectic objects. And the building itself is like a pastiche kind of building, which is a colonial uh, approach to a traditional Rajput style architecture. So the architect, Lancaster, was a state architect for the Jodhpur royal family and made this, designed this building in 1936. And uh, sadly, in those 80 odd years, the building has taken a beating and more and more things uh, were ruined in many ways through apathy and you see the way the things are. And then we went about trying to see that how is the space planned when we kind of inherited this project. So when we bid for this project and went for our first recce trip, you see them all the things in the dark pink are the spaces that the administrative uh, staff took over. So you had less than 40% of the space available to the public. Uh, so one of our biggest thing was to do a master planning. 
to do a master planning that allowed us to open up the space much more. And we opened up all the partitions. So here you see how we've done the master plan, how we created universal access for RAM based access. And then the entire formatting all the galleries, but also the storage. We were very keen that the backbone of the center is really well planned. So we do all of it in each of our projects. The idea is to always see everything in entirety and not alone. Our initial renderings and visualizations. And then going on to how we want to do. So for every project, we look at the branding, the universal language across all spaces and all materials and media. Um, I was very fortunate while working at the Victor Library Museum that Wolf Orleans had just done the rebranding. So under the stewardship of an amazing lady called Maura Gemmel, who sadly died a tragic death a couple of years ago, uh, I was part of the team that looked at the implementation of that larger kind of vision and branding. And having learned a lot from that, that was to apply to each of our projects, but also to apply a whole variety of things. You know, how does audiovisual come in seamlessly? You know, so this is the space. We removed all the partition walls that were here and brought back the building to its historic fabric. So you have the video walls over there. You have an RFID transmitter and a receiver. You have speakers there, lights 60 meters above. You have the AC, AC ducting over there. And not a single wall has been punctured for the air conditioning. Yeah. Yet you have a beautiful seamlessness with a narrative which is, doesn't have to be sequential. As you come closer, the, the graphics and the captioning and the signage reveal the cell, but every gallery has audiovisual narratives in it, not as separate things. So here again, you see the lights and the things. We also were able to salvage some of the beautiful Art Deco lights. Um, here you have the JN Gallery. Again, you can see the captions on closer. Uh, when you are closer, the hunting galleries, the painting and the royal portraiture galleries with miniatures and western style portraiture and oil paintings. And in each gallery, you see that there is, the touch screens are there. What you don't see is the seamlessness, sadly, because that is because we've put in all the hardware. So when you walk in and hopefully we'll get the virtual museum part going also um, if the Rajasthan government approves it. and. That would be fantastic because then you would have possibly an amazing precedence for how museums in India could be. Not to say that this is the best or anything like that. We don't like it's foolish to claim that at all, but just to make it a good museum and playing with the whole. So that, again, I want to say the aesthetics are not predominantly the most important thing to us for sure, but also the entirety. So here we looked at the idea of harnessing solar energy and how does that really go about to create a much more sustainable building design? So that we can meet most of energy requirements for the building within the building itself. And here you see the entire air conditioning plan of how without puncturing a single wall through the windows they come in and the ducting is above. So we looked at the, the whole light movement, the sun movement, we did some very basic, at least ecotech modeling of the spaces to understand. But we also realized that you, know, you can create a building and people may not visit it you know, because our museums are fossilized institutions. So how do you create a wondrous space if you don't create a wondrous surrounding. So we, we really um, persuaded to get this project, which was to do the Umer Udyan. So to create a formal old Charbagh style Rajput garden and to make it look like it was from that era, uh, but also to make it as part of a much larger project, which was the Umed Udyan, the 23 acre garden, which was built in 1935 and over the years has got completely denuded. So part of our exercise has been to plant 1,100 saplings of trees that flower and fruit. They'll bring in a full slew of birds and an ecosystem, but also provide amazing cooling and shade from the incredible heat that anyone who's been to Rajasthan, especially the desert area of the Thar and Jodhpur, uh, can vouch for. But to create a space through proper and diligent research of what are the trees to spend a lot of time in the forest department, horticulture department, looking at flowers, what color are they, when did they flower? So to create that thing in a way, but randomize it. So it didn't feel like we were plastic surgeons playing with nature, but looking at, you know, are there deciduous trees? Are there sub trees? What are the array of canopies you have? And that, that love for that nature, which comes into each of our projects is something which was very exciting. And I was very lucky to get a project um, and a small part of the project was to create botanical paintings. So here's a whole bunch of botanical paintings, some of which were in the garden 
and some which are not, but these are all botanical paintings of Indian flowering plants, which come from elsewhere and some are indigenous to the country. And this brings us to the last part of the, um, the session, which looks at art, craft and architecture. So I wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, while I am very excited, you know, I started my journey in design, not by going to NID, but to buy working in crafts in my gap year. I took two years off after college. I did my bachelor's in history and that's why heritage interests me a lot. But when I took the two years off, I worked with a lot of craft communities in Orissa, in Rajasthan, in Ladakh, in Punjab, and I fell in love with the idea of craft and design. And then I applied to NID. So when I graduated, I was very keen that something should surely happen as part of my practice of how can we make tradition meet modernity in a way which is seamless? How can we bring art and craft together? So if it is the South Bank installation in London, so this is the largest cultural institution of the UK. But even though it's the largest one, it's really exciting because 3,000 people walk through its gates almost every day. And that is exciting as hell because most of those events are free. So this is the Clo Ballroom, which is the largest wooden ballroom of entire Britain. And I was commissioned to do this installation, which I've mentioned was alluding to the poem by Keshav Das. But it was this whole play of light and opacity, but also celebrating making of things. So when you open up the curtains at the back, if you see the opacity here, you have the black curtains, there's no sheerness that you see, which is evident. But the minute you open it up, the road that goes to Waterloo Station and Sadar, you have this entire gamut of translucency. And what you don't realize till you come closer is that you see these kind of small uh, jali work on the right, that they are metal work, or these are pleated fabrics, or these are almost seven or eight layers of fabric. And when you come closer, you get to see them. So we wanted that whole making and that whole discovery and taking people on a journey. So, and if you don't see them, it doesn't matter. But if you do them, there's a great kind of a kick to it in a way. So the making of that little part, which was red on the right side, uh, if I go back to this one on the right, this is how it was made. You know, these were amazing welders, uh, this sultana work, and that's a slew of welders as an intern from my studio and I working with them. And this took us to the next installation we did at the South Bank Center. So I was very lucky we got commissioned the second time. And here is the then director introducing the festival. And on closer view, you realize that how this thing may have been fashioned. But here are pictures of how it was made. And these are both the installations were made in my studio. So I feel really proud of it that it was made in our studio, it was designed by me and conceived by me, but made in a way that really was site specific. And the lovely tailor who uh, is no longer with me, Sanjay Ji, who passed away sadly, but he did this amazing exercise. And in his gap uh, kind of phases, you know, he would do odd things. So the shirt I'm wearing is made by him. And uh, so, and that takes me to other journeys uh, of how crafts come into larger spaces. So I talked about naturally the Bangalore airport's uh, Lotus House shop. And I was talking about the Kalamkari painting, which is on the canopy of the ceiling. And, these were made um, here on silk, largely with Indian matter and a smattering of indigo, but also the whole journey of it, you know, working with 30 fabulous artists from Shikalas in Andhra Pradesh. I don't really know if it's Andhra or Telangana anymore. Uh, and this is when the whole agitation was happening. So we had to move them to Bangalore. And again, the whole dialogue, so there were little drawings I had made, and then they had made some drawings, and there was a series of dialogues and going back and forth and coming up with this beautiful piece that you saw. But also that, you know, um, takes me to the other, uh, complete other kind of antithesis of that project, which is in Tripura. Uh, this is a project that I was part of for almost three years, which was the, with the Tripura bamboo machine. So it was to really figure out that how could we work with a traditional skill set and do a learning or a teaching of new production methodologies and new ways of working while creating something which is contemporary yet traditional. So you have me in one of the workshops over there. Uh, and this is what came about. So here's a lovely little bamboo stool, which is a foldable bamboo stool that goes into a bag. And this was selected to be shown at the London uh, Design Festival where I got an award of some kind. And because of that award, I got a stall. And with the stalls, 
I showed a bunch of projects that we were doing then. And what is lovely is that this stool is bent, steam bent, and it's steam bent using no electricity. It has a little tea kettle, uh, aluminum tea kettle, which creates the steam. The steam is whisked away from the kettle by a little sleeve, which is from a sink uh, plastic pipe into a large piece of bamboo. You have to almost kind of visualize it, have this four inch dia bamboo, and we put these little splits of bamboo in it. And naturally there's much more complexity than just that. And then to figure out that how could we take it out and bend it and keep the bent piece in place um, thereafter. So with uh, a lovely person I discovered, a designer called Nick Rockcliffe in London, we had a nationwide competition because of the award I won in London. Uh, and the British Council had this fabulous uh, competition for me to select a colleague who could work with me in Tripura or any project of mine. So from all of them, I found Nick. And Nick being an engineer and a product designer, co-designed this tool with me. And this was actually gesturing towards uh, a lot of work done by someone who really uh, I respected a lot called MP Ranjan. And for a lot of us who went to NID, uh, Ranjan was one of those path-breaking people and Aditi Ranjan, you know, who guided us. And another person who was, who we lost very recently, Vikas Sathkalekar. These were the kind of people who kind of shaped, I won't say they were inspirations or influences because sometimes they, they almost seem silly just to say that and sometimes they feel the right word. But they were the kind of people who shaped that kind of ideology. And here, you know, it's the making of things of how we created those stools and, you know, but from that going into the art itself, you know, like how were things fashioned? So I talked about the Bangalore airport's art installation, but the whole making of it, you know, working with uh, l and uh, figuring out how the structural stability, how we put on things, and then working with the craftspeople. Uh, so the, mini the Mysore painters of Mysore, MS Anandan workshop, and Chola style Tanjore sculptures. So here you have the making of it, and the making of the Chola style sculptures in lost wax, uh, bronze sculptures near Tanjore. And then again, coming back to the private space where I curated a whole collection of art, but also situated it with a whole scenographic elements, while also creating site-specific art pieces that were traditional and contemporary. So here you see a kind of a close-up of it in some ways. Uh, here, the idea was to create a whole piece which was uh, celebrating the idea of bountifulness and to use national materials like lapis lazuli with 24 karat gold. So this was a project which had the indulgence that we don't have in many of the projects like uh, we do elsewhere for public institutions. But the idea was that how do we really show those nuances? So if it's the red, the red is from cinnabar, the gold is of real 24 karat gold, the blue is of lapis lazuli, like I said. And the idea was that we created an atelier and for four months or so, the artists and I worked together, five from uh, Shri Kalahasti in Andhra Pradesh, five from uh, Jaipur. But I wanted to show a contemporary piece, which is very different from that. So this is uh, a piece which I called uh, Tejas or Sublime Light. And it is that ethereal quality of light uh, that I mentioned before, which is about the light uh, on water. And this is almost imagining what would be a morning light uh, on water if it's rendered into a textile piece. Uh, but so this is more about the kind of visual uh, uh, kind of arts, but I want to talk also about the performative kind of spaces and uh, projects as such. So this is a space that we design, but we also conceive all the installations for. So this is a beautiful space at the Nehru Center in Bali. We took over 35,000 square feet or so. And this is a performance art piece uh, by Elise Rockstart who's uh, there with Yuki Elias, and also Raghavendra Ji, Raghavendra Baliga, who's an amazing uh, musician with Santur and flute, and Mohammed Muneem. So you see that there's a different style of uh, rendition because there's original music, there's films that Elise and I made uh, and projected onto the thing, but also the piece itself. So here's a small clip. So this is just a little clip of the kind of things we created. That was done in collaboration with Nonsense Studio. We collaborate a lot. Uh, that has been the kind of uh, our kind of DNA. And this is another 
a space that we designed where startups really pitch their projects to large uh, corporate houses. From there, completely different performative spaces. This is a beautiful and poignant play by Nandita Das, um, a play about a troubled a relationship. It's called Between the Lines. And the idea was to really portray that also through scenography and the way the lighting happened kind of augmented that. So you have a very linear kind of scenography playing with opacities of light. And the same opacities come into another set design that uh, I did for Shonjoy Roy, um, the founder of Teamwork Arts at the Jaipur Literature Festival. Uh, so the kind of abstracted kind of uh, stage design. So that it allows a lot of usage in seamless ways. Uh, then the entire packaging of such things. So this is Firat, a very gritty, really poignant film. It and if you have not seen, please do see it. Uh, we did the packaging design of it, of trying to bring about that same element. And then the credit titles, which again brought about that element of contrast, the element of you know, uh, the dark underbelly of society. Uh, and from that, I want to come to the last few slides, which are really how do you interpret while you're talking of built heritage and talk about art and technology. So I want to talk about this project, which is we are doing interpretation of two sacred temples and living temples of Orissa, Puri and Lingaraj. Uh, they're beautiful old, about a thousand year old temples, but the idea was to create a narrative which is different from many of the narratives we have today. The idea is about how do you create something which is the excellence of built heritage that we have. So here you see the model below and you see how the model has come about above. You see the backdrop with this kind of carved thing that we had envisaged and how the carving is happening. And then to take smaller kind of elements to kind of just show our journey in a way. So here is a plan of the Puri temple. And this is the front facade of the Bhogmanda. And then through our research, it took me to the British Library. And this is an image I got from the British Library. And uh, because you can't take pictures inside. And then the final drawing. So the idea was to work with traditional uh, sculptors to work in a way which is very architectural. So to make a very architectural drawing. And then to have that translation as a miniature model that you see on the left and the real piece for the space on the right. So you also get a sense of scale of it. Here is the making of it. We document almost everything we uh, do, not necessarily to kind of show off or something, but just to kind of share with people because it's such excitement for us, but also the kind of research that has gone in and you want to celebrate those kind of arts. So we've made about 15 films for this project. We've made innumerable other films which are waiting to be edited since 2002. And the whole planning of it. So before we made the model, how do we really envisage that whole complex? We saw the virtual model. And then you see the plan, the uh, thing, and then you see the actual model. So this is the model of the Lingraj temple. And here in this time lapse, you see how it's being collected. But this took a good 15 months. And two amazing craftspeople who made it obsessively their kind of journey with mine. And after 15 months and a whole team of people. So if I ever say me or we, it's actually interchangeable because there's a team which actually assists and, and works with it. And if it wasn't for the team, nothing could happen either. But it's also my own kind of sweat and tears. So I'm very um, attached to these projects. And here you have the making of it. So you see the architectural plan of it. And then finally the exhibiting of it. So this was finally shown as an exhibition also. It's not meant for the exhibition only, but this was an exhibition we had at the India International Center in Delhi uh, just a few months ago, about eight months ago. And that's how the exhibition looked. Again, we wanted to have not, uh, we wanted to show heritage in a very contemporary and a modern setting. Uh, so that's how the exhibition looked. And with that, I hope, you know, uh, that it kind of shows this kind of journey of traditional modernity and the idea of, how I, I look at the idea of something that's part of a heritage and part of contemporaneous uh, in a way that it really should be uh, about celebration. We have, enough, we have enough things to grapple with in our country. We are such an incredible country and such a messed up country. And the idea is to really not really feel embarrassed or um, feel ultra patriotic, but really to tell a story which is very nuanced and uh, and I think those are the kind of learnings that I have uh, to share. So with that, I come to an end and if Asad, uh, on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Um, 
thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, you know thank you for keeping it within the hour uh, you know to the audience i mean so he had the most amazing slides and we had to struggle the whole of today how to pare this down to a one hour presentation and uh, i think you all should be you all should feel cheated i i didn't let you all see some of the other slides but that's for the phase 2 or the 2.0 of this conversation um what i'm going to do uh, now so that is i'm going to just ask you a few questions we have a few audience questions trickling in um uh, perhaps you know some of the sections that we did not share with the audience i'll probably dwell into that um and uh, uh, audience if you want to just post a few questions in the q and a box that would be great we have about uh, 30 minutes to go so uh, please do otherwise i i'll be happy to just sit and have a fireside chat with if you want so uh, so you know uh, so that we have this we have this many lovely conversations and, and this all started with when sonjo introduced us uh, but you know uh, i mentioned that avid is also very keen on sustainability and we've also launched our sustainability now series with the csmbs so in reference to your work uh, incorporate the can you tell us a little more about the importance of incorporating the principles of sustainability into your design and what are some of the the major ethical and sustainable design approaches that you've incorporated into your projects um uh you know that embody your philosophy i remember when we were chatting very casually and you showed us the jal mahal uh, kind of images and you you talked about the dyes that were used out there also yeah. so if you could just share some light on that yeah. so i think uh one of the things i did talk a few years ago at yale i remember one of the uh, architects sitting in the audience asked that you know i uh, i didn't talk about ecology and sustainability at all in the in my presentation and actually it was i uh, i was a bit surprised by the question and i suddenly realized it was foolish of me not to have included in my presentation then and it's 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 something which i feel very strongly about it but it's also like when you talk to someone when you meet someone and we were talking about this as before but you know when you meet someone you take it for granted if you are in a safe environment that that person is a good person you take that person <laughs> is going to be a lovely person who's not going to do any harm True. and is going to be a person which ha- embodies all the good characteristics that you want from a person and that is how i feel a good design is that you know if it is if it is a good design it has to be responsible it has to be sustainable it's a shame if it is not that is not good design so the fact that one has to talk about it i mean i i'm going to talk about it so i don't mean to <laughs> kind of <laughs> talk about it but i'm just saying that you know it's a shame it's not integral to design language so when we talked about jal mahal you know but uh, i want to talk much more about uh, from the perspective of jodhpur and gdca apart from jal mahal jal mahal itself uh, and so i want to just take that idea and to say that why what we were doing here we looked at when we did our bid even though it wasn't part of our bid document we did, it was even mandated we actually ate up into our own budget but we said that solar energy plant will be part of our thing universal access will be part of our thing the fact we will do an app which will work for people who are literate or not will be part of our thing so that is democratic we want it to be accessible to all we want children to come from schools that are not well off to schools that are well off we want to create a wondrousness of things and we want to imbue things with a scientific temperament that schism that we have of arts and science you know but you call science a state of art technology you know what is state of art you know it's almost like art and science coming together so all our spaces um are like that so beat energy beat looking at waste you know uh, how is waste black water grey water what happens how is it treated you know composting so in the garden design one of the things we are fighting many battles for is to create a vermi compost bin because you are in the garden we are creating a bio toilet that will have no waste be linked to no sewage system of the city that all the waste will be treated there and it's a battle we're fighting the city authority which say that no that's not your mandate you know so that is part of our journey in many ways yeah wonderful thank you for sharing so yeah. i'm going to uh, suddenly we have this flux of audience questions so i'm going to interweave the audience questions with some of my questions and so neeta maitra uh, actually asked i haven't received any training in art never got a chance to pursue art but i feel drawn towards art and design I work as an assistant professor in economics at the college in Bangalore. My drawing is good. I draw sometimes as a hobby. 
kindly suggest how I can start my journey in art and design. And coming to you, you worked with some amazing people from, you, know, you mentioned some of the people you interned with from Raghurai to B.D. Doshi. I mean, uh, just amazing me mentors and icons. So how do you mentor in this field that is such a crossover discipline? Uh, are there any mentorship programs that exist? Can you tell um, us any more about the design heroes that you admire? Any particular projects that have kind of influenced you that kind of set the benchmark for you? Yeah. Uh, I think it's always uh, when I was drawn to the arts, naturally because my father's an artist, my mother's right. a writer, uh, I was drawn to the arts. But I've like one of the sad parts is that art was often seen when one was younger as something that men didn't do, you know, or it was yeah. something that meant to be a hobby, you know. Um, and by now, luckily, it's very accepted. But the idea is that, you know, why do we have these kind of silos, you know, that this is science and this is arts and this is business and never should they come together. And the whole trajectory in my kind of work has been that, you know, they must come together. If you want to create a sustainable project, not just by sustainability, by ecology, but sustainability as a business practice. Uh, by way of best practices and by, by way of people who have done amazing work, I mean, uh, it's so tough suddenly to think of things like that, but there's so many people who do that very nuanced way of working. And sometimes it's not even just people, but it's places. Like, you know, it is parts of, when you go in parts of India, like, you know, you look at this beautiful building designed by Neil Kanchaya, who used to be the Dean of Architecture and SEP, uh, which is uh, in Kutch. And you see mm -hmm. such a climate controlled, beautifully designed building uh, for that space using terracotta pots, terracotta tiles, the way the ventilation system works or the space he designed at a Center for Environment and Edu Education. And you have dime a dozen. You see the beautiful building of developmental alternatives done by Ashok Lal. And it's not to say that one, I would never say that to be inspired by a person because all of us have so many frailties and we are so, we have so, we have as many good projects as bad projects. You know, so I would never be blind to the bad in, in that. So I would always talk about projects. I mean, looking back at my own projects, sometimes I feel like, you know, gosh, what a mistake we made. But the idea was to do the best we could at that point and to learn from it and to make sure that we can always redeem ourselves and do better things later. So and I hope that kind of answered in some ways your uh, question. I think so. I think so. Uh, so what is the, I mean, there's so many questions now pouring in, but you know, what is the difference between designing to present and showcase tangible heritage versus intangible heritage? You know, you, you, your, your, Practice just crosses the gamut. So. so that has been something that I feel very excited about. So the idea of working with new music, performances, uh, traditional art forms, but not just traditional, but also contemporary. Uh, and how do you show them? So do you show them through, through a video? Do you show them by having live? How much of this and how much not of that? While creating a milieu and a setting for the whole thing. And that is something that really has excited me a lot. And I think with the years, I think even if you're really daft, you just get good at what you do, you know, because you do it long enough. <laughs> and I think, you know, having worked for 20 years and having done 100 projects, you've burnt your fingers so many times that you just know how to do something better, you know, and uh, in a way that, that benefits the project, that benefits the people who are part of the project. So if you're doing a project in Orissa, we want to link it to craft communities over there. We want to link it to traditional communities, not just crafts, building <laughs> arts, you know, the cuisine, that comes in, the farmers that are, who is, who's doing organic farming, where are they based, are they tribal farmers, are they for rural farmers, how do you link it to the city? So this kind of seamlessness between rural, urban, international, and learning from each of those uh, milieus and adapting it to what a project needs. So that. Wonderful. So you're being very modest, but uh, moving on, you know, uh, we've had this uh, session called Avid Online and we've had these amazing, uh, you know, practitioners from the design field like yourself and your, your colleagues come in. And I, I, there are certain of these thoughts that kind of resonate with me, like, you know, the international language of design, there's nothing international or Western or European, it's design, it's good design. You know, your space should be about your space and living with stories, but you're designing for someone else. You're not designing your own home. So, you know, and you worked across a range of disciplines, a range of genres, from exhibitions to museums to from graphic design. So what are some of the, uh, the uh, can you elaborate some of the aspects of the crossover design? Because, you know, uh, 
it's not it's not tangible versus intangible it's it's different genres and the nuances are so different so I, I mean, this takes me to a small anecdote that I want to say that I was on a fellowship in France uh, for a part and I went to Saint-Étienne, which is this little city. Mm -hmm. And Saint-Étienne is naturally remarkable because Corbusier did his swan song projects over there. And okay. uh, it is the city of design. And I remember I wanted to, I had a meeting which is scheduled by the curator of the main city to do design. And the curator refused to meet me. And the person from the French embassy, who uh, from the uh, Ministry of External Affairs, was embarrassed. And uh, I said, you know, okay, tough for me, but you know, it doesn't matter. But I said, I want to know why the person cancelled. Was it a clash of dates? And she said, no, because she feels that there is nothing like contemporary design in India. So it's a waste of her time. So I was, I, I didn't know if I should be offended or if I should be amused. And uh, I, w I was just surprised. And then a few years later, I was on a fellowship in the Netherlands. And I teach a bit in the Netherlands in Rotterdam. But um, there was again on a fellowship. So I was supposed to have a meeting with two people. And they refused the meeting. And this time it was the Ministry of External Affairs person from the Dutch side. And he was embarrassed. And he said, you know, they don't want to meet you because they feel that you will copy the design you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. And then I had to make a presentation in Amsterdam the following day. And I changed my entire presentation. Because I had a whole bunch of meetings with people who did the app for the Van Gogh Museum, the people who did the branding for Amsterdam, you know, so a whole variety, a slew of people. And one thing that came across was how people see each other, you know, and how people see, like, I, I almost, I dislike this word, people like us. What is people like us, you know, it is, it is, it creates this weird divide between us and them. Yeah, right. I would probably have a greater affinity in many ways with a person sitting somewhere else, be it in India or international, doesn't matter. In the kind of the person that is, you know, it doesn't matter. And this is something I find peculiar. So I find there is a big difference between, I think we have an asset being in India because we have, we have an old culture. And how do you really dip into that old culture and have a nuanced statement when you actually approach something which is very contemporary? And especially in a country like ours, where we have so many, so many centuries living simultaneously, juxtaposed. And in many ways, if it was a celebration of tradition, modernity, if you see Japan, or you see Iran, or you see Brazil, you know, or Mexico, these are, or China, you know, these are such exciting paradigms. So I would say that, you know, we have so many things that are happening in our country, which are similar. And so, yeah, so I just feel like, uh, those paradigms have much more similarity than really European or Indian and things like that. But, but just in continuation with this thought, there was an interesting uh, anecdote we thought about was how does de design uh, in this context act as an ambassador of the Indian culture on a global stage? Do you feel like a, a cultural ambassador? Because you said, you know, you've shared so many projects with us, which you've done internationally, where you've taken... Indian culture and you presented it on a on a global platform. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually feel like that very often. And it's sometimes sometimes I don't realize it because you know you're working, you're working long hours, you've just about caught a flight, you're on the flight, you've fallen asleep, you wake up, you it's like going to work. You go into a university or you go to meet a uh, an organization that you're going to work with, and suddenly you realize that there you've been judged a bit differently sometimes. And I'm not talking racism or prejudice. It's not about that. It's really thinking that, you know, will you get what we are trying to do? And did we make a mistake by taking you on? You know, so when I was selected to do the design of two of the exhibitions in the Museum Readburg, I remember there was a great sense of anxiety thereafter. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, whispers. And then I got to know from the former director, who was a lovely person, he was instrumental for this called Epahat Fisher. And he said, you know, there's a lot of anxiety on having chosen you. We've never chosen an Asian designer, let alone an Indian one, mm. you know, mm. and we don't know what we've got into, but what he said, but I have been to NID and I taught in NID in 1964. So I know what I'm talking about. So it was quite lovely that I was fortunate to have a person like that, but often I'm not. So when I start a project, I always make a presentation. When I teach in a college, I always make a presentation. I just feel it is to allay fears, you know, so they don't think, here's a schmuck who's walked in and he knows nothing of the world, you know. So I made the presentation and that was lovely. So when I started in Rotterdam teaching Willem de Kooning Academy, I started with the presentation that happened. And, uh, and 
it was really funny because I was supposed to do one or two project reviews the day after, but I ended up doing 50 project reviews suddenly. And what was meant to be a two hour slot became an eight hour slot. So it was very interesting, but because people felt, oh, actually, his critique could be relevant to our milieu too. So yeah, mm -hmm. so sometimes it's very interesting. So this idea of carrying one's culture, which I didn't think, you know, one would like to be as a, almost like a global citizen, but it, you're part of a culture and you naturally carry it with you. But how does, how does modern design effectively preserve and showcase and revive a centuries old culture and heritage in India and also on the international stage? See, you know, with online and in this, uh, uh, post or pre, uh, you know, in this COVID era that we're living in, things have changed, you know, yeah. everything is open, everything is flat, uh, you know, access for all. Uh, how has that changed in, 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 you know, in making heritage relevant to everyone, and especially the Indian heritage, which is what we're talking yeah. about? So I think the COVID is naturally unprecedented in many ways now, but if you think about it, you know, we've had epidemics in smaller societies every once in a while, but naturally we are at a different age. And mm -hmm. I think naturally the whole virtual platform and digital platform, but this whole idea of sharing, I think a lot of time has not been spent sometimes. And there are some people who are doing commendable work. Like if you see the work of Sahabedia or the Google Art and Culture. Or Avid. Or Avid, yes. <laughs> not to forget. <laughs> so, uh, so all of these kind of journeys are quite incredible because there's a certain sense of documentation. You know, and the idea is if it is for the larger audience, then it is fantastic. The pity is that if it is not for the larger audience, you know, and naturally there has to be a level of monetization. But what is monetized and what is not? You know, that is the exciting part. And I think the idea of modern design showcasing heritage design, uh, I mean, heritage and tradition was in its time contemporary. Heritage, if you look at built heritage, right? But if you look at anything that is craft, is a traditional heritage, but it is like the Hindi word or the comes from parampara. Yeah? Right? So it is a, it's a tradition which goes on. So it's not like that is past and pastiche and this is mm -hmm. new and contemporary. They're just two different paradigms where you look at things together. So. But, but tell us more about your work. I mean, you know, you have a whole section about your work with cr the crafts community and craft people. And why is it so in important to incorporate their inputs and skills and expertise into designing the spaces and the exhibition spaces that you showcase and present? Uh, tell us, uh, yeah. you know, a little more about, you know, your product design that you do with, with the space. I mean, there's a whole other uh, yeah. aspect of your career and persona, which we haven't even yeah. uh, addressed yet. Mm -hmm. so. So yeah, so I think um, when I took my gap year after Delhi and I traveled across the country and you know, looking at craft communities and working at grassroots level, um, I worked in Dhokra Craft you know, six months through the Dasta Craft funding. And uh, I worked in four very small semi-tribal and tribal villages in ba Mayurban district to going and working as an apprentice with a family of dyers and printers in the Jodhpur district. And I had to wash 100 bed sheets a day in the pond you know, mix the dyes with my hand, you know, and you're mixing indigo with lime and, you know, your hands crack and you realize how something is done. And once you realize it, you have an immense appreciation of it and mm -hmm. understanding how simple the methodologies are, but how amazing the output is. And it's not only a skill set, it's, it's imbued with a whole symbology, with its utility and all of those things. And if you think about it, it's one of the key employing sectors of our country. We forget it's like the third or the fourth largest employing sector of our country. But the attrition is almost 10% per annum. Like it's an insane amount of attrition you know? now, but probably 10% in a decade, but that's still a huge number we're talking about. Now, if each of us who worked in the arts or in any other thing, if we took on onto ourselves that in every project, there'll be something we will do an X amount of money will go into working with traditional mm. communities, mm -hmm. be it farming, be it build, be it craft, and it may not be a project, but every, at least every enterprise in a certain time span. Then there'll be a great sense of uh, support system, a symbiotic relationship. And if we create a symbiotic relationship, it's never a patronizing relationship. It comes with empathy. And mm -hmm. that is something that I was very keen on. And you know, being a designer, sadly, you only get hired to make products. You know? So I was much more interested in the livelihood projects and the whole dimension, but at the end of it, naturally you must have a good product because at the end of it, if you don't do a good product, that's the proof is in the pudding. So, yeah. But in continuation with that, and I think you have a question 
question from Professor Aladdin in, from London, actually. He says, this question is about modernity. Uh, it seems that Siddhartha Studio has an ambition around sustainability and empowerment, perhaps even inclusion. Can you tell us a bit more about your choices of materials and how you work with people? What is the hallmark of the materials you tend to use or not? and any constraints, particular resources in relation to working in India? And how do you consult with local populations? So it's a long question. Audiences uh, to artisans. And how does the process manifest itself in your finished work? Do you depict these in the people and the processes uh, and the final products, essentially about materiality <laughs> yeah. and your choices? Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, I talked about the kind of divides we have in our country and actually when you do public projects, you know, you're working with very little resources. And while growing up, you know, our family wasn't a moneyed family. We came from mm -hmm. a lower middle class family. We had lesser means. We never asked for things because we just felt like, you know, our parents did the best they could and they didn't have more. So the idea was you did, you got by with what you got by. You didn't eat non veg at home because you couldn't afford it. No simple choices mm -hmm. of things. And with that came simple choices of what you did in life. You know, and uh, if there are projects that don't have money, you make the choice of material that needs less money. So when we did Jodhpur Museum, one of the things, it's hilarious. Like, you know, we made this incredible tender document for the bidding process of selecting the contractors. Yeah, they should have this machinery, they should have this expertise, this much manpower, so on and so forth. And the person who got selected to do the entire furniture for the entire museum had two workers, one drill machine and one saw machine. And it was insane. And it was a three crow interiors project that he had to do. And it was, it, so we changed our whole design in a way that we could pull off what we want to do. So this, once you finish a project, you can't say that, you know, I'm sorry, we didn't have money. I'm sorry, this person was not the right person. People are going to judge you by what happened. They're not going to judge us. They're going to judge the museum. They're going to judge the state. So the responsibility of all of that we carry on our shoulders. So the idea was that you choose the material that A, benefits the project, B has the resources to do that, C has the expertise to do that. So that I think. Wonderful. So Serena Chaudhary has asked, uh, I'm a sculptor and adding to my, uh, my question, I'd like to know what are the possibilities to pitch ceramics as a sustainable medium for art and culture design? What are the possibilities? I think lots. We work a lot with ceramics ourselves. Uh, I learned pottery under Sadar Gujaran Singh, you know, when I was a 19 year old person and, you know, him being a 92 year old man and father of Delhi Blue Pottery. So I fell in love with ceramics, you know, incredibly. And we try to get in ceramics in many ways, but also it's a shame because we don't use ceramics in contemporary architecture very well in our country sometimes. But there are amazing aberrations to all of these things. You have, like I said, Ashok Lal or Neil Kanchaya, Pradeep Sajdeva, who recently passed away. You know, Sanjay Agarwal. So there's a whole slew of people and ceramics by virtue of being either porous or non-porous, being terracotta or stoneware or porcelain or bone chana, that and being an insular material, you know, and having thermal mass. So there's such immense potential to doing that. And in three of our projects, actually, we're using ceramics quite uh, innovatively. Uh, so yeah. Just a, a quick uh, question from through Shah. Says, so can you share any online magazine, journal, websites where we can find out more about the kind of work your your contemporaries do? Also, when will the JDCA app be ready? And that comes to a, another question I have: is 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 are there any other benchmarks? Are there you know there, we have a lot of young people who have tuned in today. We had close to, I mean, three hundred seventy-five people who registered for this talk, and you know we generally go through the profiles to see and to kind of help answer questions is what are some of the advice you have for the young people who want to embark in a journey like you, including resources uh, uh, that one can avail of? You know, you and I are lucky at the time, I mean, are unlucky compared to the time we started our careers, resources didn't exist. We kind of had to make our own way. Yeah. Now there are more structured ways and channels of getting these. So yeah. any, any advice? So yeah, so uh, I don't know if I'm, a, I'm the right person to advise because when we start projects, you know, we we don't uh, look at, because often there's this whole thing of inspiration when you ape something and you say it's inspired by so-and-so. So as a rule, we never do uh, that kind of research in the beginning at least. We do a whole 
whole concept and then we look at what has what have others done but we have already conceptualized by then so that we can see that oh that's interesting but we don't want to do that oh this is interesting but we will never do that or oh, this is interesting but that's not us you know or this project doesn't demand it so i think those are the kind of things but i think the biggest challenge has been to create everything that is made within our studio mm -hmm. you know and created by us so the sense of ownership so imagine if you were a writer and you, you took certain passages from different other sections because you liked neruda's poem and you said this is your part or you liked someone else's and you had this part you know or if you were a filmmaker you took little film clips so to me it almost feels like that but in somehow in design it often one gets away with it but i just chose to that we will never do that so we didn't embark on the journey but the journey of really creating things and we make a model for everything we make so the wooden model you saw jd sender about though the building design is doshi's we made the model you know so we make a physical model for each of our projects so i think that so there, there are so many questions and and all these questions have part a part b so i'm going to somebody <laughs> by the name of s who i don't know who he or she is this is the part c of his or her question i'm in the process uh, i'm passionate about history and documentation but with the background in writing and marketing what do you feel is appropriate path for someone who'd like to work with studios ateliers like yourselves in a hands on way are art institutions really interested in hiring professionals that want more public engagement for their projects and want to work towards outreach and outreach is something you believe in a lot so yeah but it's a good question for you so uh so outreach is something i think all our projects we look at outreach and education and programming so even if we are not hired for it we will always make a whole dossier and most of the time the client will tell us oh this is not what you were hired for and sadly nothing is then envisaged uh so this at least with jd center award we are making sure we have a fabulous programming to our whatever bandwidth can handle uh and i feel that there are i'm sure there are other studios we are, there's no way that we are the only studio doing it you know we, i'm sure we are not that unique there are so many bright people across the country and across the world so i but i only know my studio well i don't know i live a cocoon life i come here early in the morning i go back late in the night i don't have a great social life uh, much to my partner's dismay but we we so th i don't know what is happening out there i know what is happening out here and it is great fun to work with professionals so we work with a lot of professionals and right now we are working remotely with a whole slew of professionals across the country so we are most happy to have people who will work with us there must be other studios who want to like that i'm sure asad you yourself must be dying to have people like that also like me <laughs> so, yeah. uh but uh, you know in the interest of time i'm just going to quickly wrap up ask you one quick question and you know we've got over 25 questions that we've not answered yet so if we may uh kind of impose on you to send you these questions and the avid yeah. team will capture them and maybe we can just send them to uh, the participants who are eager to get these answered but you know your your practice i mean after all the conversations we've had it's just so amazing and so what's next what's the next utopian dream the utopian project you know covid has been a bit of a debbie downer for many of us but for us dreamers you know life goes on yeah so uh you know so what's the so i think the jd center art uh, for me is the big thing uh it's something that's going to be there for years because i mean the building comes up and that's just the beginning you know then the whole how do you make a vibrant space how do you have programming you don't want it to only be about the collection you want it to be about learning you want it to be about interaction you want it to be about people engaging with each other you want to create an ambiance if someone wants to come for a coffee they come there you know if someone wants to buy a product they come there if someone wants to come for a master class from a basket maker or from a raghurai or from a print maker or lakshma god or uh, how to do ikat weaving you know or they want to come for research so the idea is really to make it completely multifarious and i hope there's a like we have a fabulous internship program at jd center of art as well as a studio and you know we take in a whole bunch of people so i would love it if people apply because the idea is to more than a studio i think to jd center of art because you know these are and i would say it's the same for many such you know projects that happen there are projects which are so impactful and well meaning and they need good minds who are passionate you know intelligent and efficient minds uh to be part of it and i think that is something that you know uh i i feel always kind of stressed and really pained about when you're misunderstood and i've gone through so many projects where you know you just hard burn hard ache and you're doing the best you can for the project and you feel like we live in such a treacherous 
time that anything that is good is always thought about there must be an ulterior motive so, yeah. you know you, you uh, I, I i always jot down keywords when people speak and i wrote i wrote this word collaboration which you you mentioned several times and i said hopefully when the center is open you will reach out to avid to collaborate and we <laughs> sure. will do some fun things together <laughs> but thank you siddharth for thank this you. enthralling session it's been amazing to much. see the intricacies and nuances involved in design of a cultural space and the heritage sites and all your wonderful projects again i feel bad the audience was felt, is has been cheated out of about 100 <laughs> slides we had to chop off in, in the interest of time and to make it a, a, a master class versus a lectem but thank you for our participants i hope you gained some fascinating insight and perspectives related to the world uh, of design um, and as we promised, we will send these answers to you. Stay tuned for more engaging programs through the week for Avid Online. Uh, next week, our week is dedicated to sculptures and statues. You're going to discover or rediscover statues from the colonial times to the contemporary times. Our next live session is on statues in colonial Bombay and Bengal presidencies on the 9th of uh, July, which is Thursday. Our next live masterclass like this is on the art of the monologue with Yuki Elias, who was also in this presentation earlier. Um, to find out more about our programs, you know, follow learning, check out our website at dot in. Uh, until next time, stay safe, healthy, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.